like you guys to give Mr. Tembe Kwayo, CEO of My Growth Fund, as the author. And, and the author of the Magna Carta of Exponentiality. Welcome to Startup Grind. Oh dear, Mercy. oh dear. <laughs> San Bonan. Welcome That's to better. Startup Grind Joburg. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so normally at Startup Grind, we start with where you were born. Yeah, where this you is were a from. thrill, right? I'm seeing alcohol and <laughs> beer bottles. <laughs> Is this an entrepreneur event or a B.O.B.? What's the headline, guys? We just try to keep it as very light as possible because you right. know sometimes you get to events, it's just too uptight and that's not how we do it at Startup Grind. Right. Yeah. Who are you? Who's Vusi? Where did you grow up? Oh, that's such a difficult question to answer. The where did you grow up part is easy. So I'm from the East Rand. I come from a... Uh, yeah. There's always one. Uh, <laughs> I come from a small township in the East Rand called Watville. Um, raised by two phenomenal parents. My father was my hero, was brutally gunned down when I was 13 years old. My mother raised five of us. Not quite sure how she did it, but she did. So I come from, a, the township I grew up in is interesting because Watville is a very small township. And, and because of that, it was incredibly communal. So. The idea of umama and Obaba was always extended to not just your own parents, but the entire community. Um, and I think it's shaped a part of my perspective now and how I live and see the world because I'm at a stage in my life where I'm wanting to do more and be more and give more. And I don't think if I'd been raised in that environment, were I not raised in that environment, I would see it quite the same way. I think one of the challenges we have with particularly urban areas, specifically Joburg, is it's incredibly individualistic. So everybody just worries about me and themselves, and it's about get what I want to get done as soon as I want to get it done. And where I'm from, you never hung it. Like, you, when we grew up, you never wanted, you never hung it. You, you were never naughty because there was always a parent around the corner. So there was a system of guidance, of mentorship, of education, of knowledge sharing that was completely communal. How would you say that, um, we, know we, 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 we always say as black people that um, a community basically raises you, you know, yeah. like you're saying, if you see your neighbor's child being naughty somewhere else, um, it does not matter if your parents are there, but the neighbor will actually make sure that they put them on check, yeah. you know. How would you say growing up in an environment like that shaped you? as who you are today. Well, not only that, but I think it shapes how, many of us don't think about it, but my view is it shapes even how we do business. So I'll, I'll use mine. That's no, okay. <laughs> so I'll, 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 use an ex I'll give you an example. So, um, um, <laughs> when you, yeah. So when, when you when you become an entrepreneur, this idea, this literature that says entrepreneurship is a sole pursuit. It's just, it's all about me. So if you read great books about entrepreneurs, if you read, if you watch great series about entrepreneurs, there's always the story told about the sage, the single individual, the person. Yeah. But you can't ever build anything sustainable, scalable, and impactful alone. It's just not possible. And so w when you when when you come into that realization, one of the things you learn is, so in fact, it was Michael Jordan who said it to me. He said, the role of a leader is, is not to lead. The role of the leader is to facilitate decision-making. That's all you do. So you pull really good, competent people around you and, and you inspire. You just spark. You ask the probing questions. And then you let them run and you let them lead. So, to relate it to your question, the growing up in a communal environment was a space where you were taught how to lead. Because Tino and Dekai had a specific way of facilitating decision making. Because I come from an incredible patriarchal family. So, men had a very specific role, yeah. women had a very specific role. Mm -hmm. But I, cu I could see and I could watch the finesse with which O Aunt would facilitate a decision, even though the uncles didn't want it. Mm. You know, I would watch how my mother would facilitate a decision, even though my dad didn't want to make it. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and you learn quite intuitively uh, almost how to get people with whom you have, or over whom you have no authority to do what you want. Mm. I want <laughs> yeah, wow, fascinating. I want to go back to the beginning of your career. Yeah. Uh, have please you ever don't. <laughs> I, I have. Have you ever been an employee at some stage in your life? I was an employee, I was a bad employee. Uh, like every entrepreneur that I engage with. No, I was, I was, I was a, uh, yeah, so I was a bad employee because I was so, so I'm, I'm very fast. I'm fast to the knowledge. Yeah. So, so you never, so you never have to tell me something twice. And typically when I learn something, I get so engrossed in it that the next time we talk about it, I'll know more than you do. Right. So it's, it's, it's in my nature. Um, <laughs> tell us, tell us more. What so did you used to do? Where, where I'm from, um, I've said this before. I don't know how to be second. I wasn't raised that way. Ooh, so okay. I don't, I don't. Um, and and it's it's a. I don't know how to be second. I don't know how to subordinate. I was not raised that way. I was raised, I was raised to believe I'm a king. That's how I was raised. And I was raised to believe, even if I walk into a room and I don't have the means, I can acquire them. Yeah. Yeah. If you send me to the jungle, I'll come back the head of the pride. I'm that guy, right? I'm like, so, so there's a, yeah. So there's a, so there is a, there is a, there is a certain psychology that goes with that. Now, when people don't know the, the, the genesis of the psychology, they'll have words for it. So they'll call it arrogance. Yes. And it's just because they don't get it. So... The reason, so you asked me the question, what kind of employee was I? And the reason I was a terrible employee was, one, I could never subordinate. So I never bought the idea that because somebody had a different title, they were better mm -hmm. or knew more. Yeah. I, just, I just thought they had more experience. But experience is a function of time, yeah. right? Which is the only variable man can't control, is time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I can't control the experience or the time aspect, the only thing I can control is the knowledge acquired over time. Which means, it, what took you 10 years to acquire, it will take you I'm going to do it in a year. Yeah, yeah, basically. Right. But yeah. when you grow, and as you grow fast, people don't, people don't get they it. They can't catch up. Yeah. yeah. But, but also, they, they don't get it. Also, and I say this with the greatest of respect. Abanda Batala <laughs> don't get it. Yes. So, they, so when you are young, and you're certain, and you're steadfast, and you're driven, and you're, they, 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 don't, they can't place you. And the reason they can't place you is because the people in their family at that age have a certain level of maturity and perspective. Mm, yes. But that's just, so yeah. I, I, was a, I was a terrible employee. I went through performance review twice. Um, <laughs> I did, I was fired for my very first job. Okay. Uh, it was, it was in, my very first job, my boss fired me. And it was actually interesting. A, a week or two ago, I was in uh, um, Santin, what was it? Santin Convention Center. And I'm walking into the elevator, and there's my boss. Uh, he, f he fired me and then invited me to his house for dinner. I'll never forget. And <laughs> True story. Was it trying to just rub salt on the wound? or? No, it was a very important lesson, and it's a lesson I've come to learn, which okay. is when you, when, how you deal with people is an important part, is an important reflection of you. And we, 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 we are never ever to personalize performance issues. So we can be friends, mm -hmm. but when we meet at eight o'clock, if my role is X and your role is Y, do your role. And, and I will keep you accountable to your role. Uh, so it, it was interesting because he hired me, he took a bet on me, I did really well, got incredibly arrogant, mm -hmm. then he fired me. And then he invited me over to his home and over dinner told me why he fired me. Hmm. And, and to give you a sense, I, you know, I, I could, because, you know, the other thing about this country is we have a strong labor regime. So I could have gone to the CCMA, but I didn't. Because yeah. the way he handled the whole thing yeah, yeah. was so important. Coincidentally, many years later, um, he rehired me. Uh, and that didn't okay. last long, because by then I was like, yeah, but now I'm clever, now yeah. you're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you having said that you were a bad employee, what are some of the good things that a normal job can actually teach and enhance um, an entrepreneurial business acumen or yeah. an entrepreneurial acumen as well because we tend to only look uh, at the bad side of employment but then there are certain things that corporate teaches you that you can actually plug into your entrepreneurial journey as well 
I will tell you for free, in the work we do today with entrepreneurs, the science tells us that there is a 28x, there is a 28x of success on entrepreneurs who've been entrepreneurs before, and the X is the variable of success. In other words, if you took two people and one of them had been in a business environment, corporate, run a line function, delivered a P&L, and the other is just an entrepreneur, the one who's done it in corporate has a 28 multiple of succeeding over the other person just because they've done it in corporate. Because what people don't get about corporate is it's a school. So you go to learn how to manage people, how to make mistakes, how to put together a marketing plan, how to report to a boss you don't like, mm -hmm. how to handle office politics. Yeah. You, all of this stuff you learn. And when you become an entrepreneur, that's stuff you're gonna have to do. Absolutely. You're gonna yeah. have shareholders that you don't like. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you gotta look at the shareholder and you go, you know, you're such a <laughs> nice guy. Because <laughs> they're funding you, right? So you, so you, so you learn, there is a, I, 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 in fact, almost every young person who comes to me who is in university and says, I want to start a business, the best advice I give them is get a job. Yeah, Just I agree. Go and yeah. do this thing somewhere else. Yes. Go, and, go and learn on somebody else's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Go make mm -hmm. the mistake on somebody else's money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that when yes. you do it, you, yes. at the very least, you have some mileage, yeah? Yes, yeah. And your first, when you first became... Uh, with lack of a better word, I'd say a full-blown entrepreneur when you just stepped into it. I'm still not. I'm still <laughs> trying to do this thing. Well, gosh, you, I must say we must just give it to you. I mean, I think you've done pretty well for yourself. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, your first business, what was it? And how, how old were you? Actually, oh if you don't mind me asking, I know I said I'm not going to ask you anything personal. This is the only personal question I'm going to ask. How old were you when you started your first business? I was 23 when I, so maybe a bit of, a bit of my, so the best thing that I've ever, I've had several things in my life that have happened to me, but one of the things I've learned over time is almost every single fortune has been a function of a, of a burden or a curse. So, and, and, I suppose it's some human beings quite don't understand. Everybody wants the nice life. Nobody wants the burden of it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, um, I am now mature enough to know that my God put me through things. And when I was going through those things, it looked like he had left me. But actually what he was doing was preparing me for my kingdom. Yeah. But I just didn't know. You know, I, so I didn't, I didn't. I didn't get that what he I didn't get that what he was doing was he was saying Moses you got to walk through 40 years of the desert otherwise you won't understand the promised land. Mm -hmm. That's what he was trying to do. Yeah. So um and and there've been several times that's happened. The loss of my father 13 was one of them. The second time was I got kicked out of university. So I went to high school I was a high achieving kid. I was top 10, four A's. I had provincial colors in three sports, regional colors in two. A uh, hundred meter athlete. I played the violin. I was in the national youth choir. I was in drama. I was that guy. Okay. I was like, <laughs> what can't you do? What exactly. Can you I can do everything. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I was, I was that guy. And then I, you know, I, and, and at the same time, I'm in grade 11 there, thereabout. I win the world championship in public speaking. I set the world record in the world championship, which had yes. been running yes. at the time for about 170 years. Wow. Right. So, uh, and so you go through massive hiatus of like success. And then I went to Varsity, and I just got lost in, in the crowd of Varsity. Mm. And I didn't do well at the end of my first year. I, I mean, I, I think I did okay academically. I didn't, I didn't four A's for see it, which was kind of my style. Mm. <laughs> um, but, but a joint to that is, you know, I couldn't afford to pay my fees. So I was, I was financially excluded at the, end wow. of, at the end of my first year at VETS. So I went and got a job because I needed a job. It wasn't like, you know, I went yeah. and got a job. Yeah. You know, coincidentally, I, I just remembered actually, my, the very first job I ever had, I was a teller. I was a cashier at a trade center okay. in Boxburg. You know, okay. when you go, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I was born yesterday. But yeah. so, I, so, so that's what I used to do. I was, a, I was a cashier at a trade center in Boxburg. Yeah. And I worked, it was uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I did that for about two months, and I hated it. Because mm. I hated earning 14 rand an hour. And the idea that there was a labor broker who took eight of the 14. Right, so, so that was probably my first job ever. Um, so when I left employment and started my business, mm -hmm. 
I, what happened, you, I don't know if any entrepreneurs have ever done this, but entrepreneurs, we, there are two types of entrepreneurs. That those that go, ah, ah, man, that's a guy. Ah, so born, eh. Right? And those that, and typically, and, and, the, and the latter will be typically women. That they're those that are very methodical and they plan it and they have a budget and how much money am I going to spend and when and how much savings do I have? Both of them are wrong. <laughs> because even the one who projects how long the, the tail of difficulty is, you always understate it. You know, I say this to entrepreneurs all the time. Over the years, I've never seen a business plan where projections say you are not profitable year one. And yet, 98% of businesses that get started die in year one. Because, you know, Excel is so nice, guys. <laughs> Excel, Excel is like our best friend. You know, you, you, know, yeah. you plug a formula. <laughs> and, then, and then Excel says, there's a loss. You go, no, let me change it. <laughs> so, so, so I go and I start my business. I um, had an office in Centurion where Accenture has their office now. That was where my office is. Yeah. Had an office in Centurion. I took out a, a lease on this, on this uh, office. I had an assistant. I paid three months rent up front. I paid my car three months up front, yada, yada. And then the sales never came. You ever open shop and nobody walks in? Mm. It just, the sales. And I tried every single trick in the book. Everything I had learned whilst I was employed, I tried. And everything failed. And I, I, it was only then that I grew to appreciate the pressure of being the boss. It was only then that I understood why my first boss fired me. Mm. I got it. I was like, holy. Because <laughs> yeah. when I was just working, it was my job was to do X. I was in sales, deliver yes. the number. Yes. He's the CEO. He's got sales, marketing, operations, finance, HR. He's got, he's got a thousand issues mm -hmm. that are all operational. And these mm -hmm. do not include the complexity of managing competitors who are moving, morphing, and changing every day. Mm -hmm. An external environment which you cannot determine at any point in time. Mm -hmm. An internal operation environment that's driven by corporate politics and people's egos. The last thing he was going to do was worry about me and not meeting my number or my, my little issues. So it was only at that time I got to go, wow. So I ended up living in my office. I lived in my office for seven months. What? Yeah, I, I lived in my office. I slept in my car. Kay. My sister's here, she'll tell you. I slept yeah. in my car. It was, it was interesting. The reason I slept, uh, well, look, I, the reason I slept in my car was because, remember, I paid for the car three months up front. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> but then the three months lapsed, yeah. and then I, I couldn't pay for the car. Mm. And... Um, Banks are fascinating things, isn't it? So the bank rang me up, and the bank calls and they go, you know you've not paid. I said, I know. And the lady says, when are you going to pay? And I thought, do I lie to her? So I said to her, I'll tell you what, why don't you pick a date? And she said, why? I said, well, then we'll both be surprised <laughs> when that date comes and I don't pay you. Because <laughs> I don't have the money now and I don't think I'll have it. And she, true story, she was on the phone, she picked the date, she put the date on the system, she said, I put it on the system, and the date came and I didn't pay her. She was surprised, and I was surprised. <laughs> so, but the bank, you know, banks are interesting creatures, and banks are, are great normalizers of ego. Yes. Uh, anytime your ego gets ahead of you, just go to the bank. <laughs> it's a great, just a great way to check yourself. Yeah, yeah. And the bank rang me up and they said, you've not paid for your car. It had, it had been another three months. They said, you've not paid for your car. We need to come and collect it. It's a lovely word they use. It's called a repossession. Yeah. I love yeah. the word because there, there's almost the idea that I possessed it. Now you're taking it back, isn't it? It's like an expropriation without compensation. <laughs> so so the, bank, the bank called me up and they said they wanted to repossess the car. And I couldn't surrender the car. If for no other reason, but because I was trying to build a business. I was, it was just, I, how was I going to do client meetings and late night meetings? And, and where were you, know, you going to sleep? And, and where was I going to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, um, I, um, I'll never forget the day. I'll actually never forget the day. It was, a, it was a Wednesday. And I was on my way home. And my mom phoned me. And she said, there's somebody here from the bank. So I suggest you don't come home. <laughs> True story. High to your mother. Yeah, so... so uh, so, in fact, what happened is my mother prepared a little kit bag with clothes in it. Mm -hmm. 
And I drove home and I went not to my street but to the next street. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they came around and they gave me the kit bag. And that was the last time they saw me for months. Wow. And I went and I parked downstairs in my basement. I was up every single morning, four o'clock. Every single morning I was up. I'd go upstairs into the bathroom. I'd clean myself. I'd change and I'd work every mm -hmm. single day until 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Every single day. Because this is, and if you're an entrepreneur, just if you hear nothing else from me, just remember this. Faith is action in the absence of evidence. Yes. Yes, yes, and if, yes. if, you, if you cannot pursue, even when there is no evidence to suggest what you're doing is working, don't even try it. Don't even, yeah, just, yeah. Just, yeah. Don't even try it. Get a job somewhere. And at that point, what would you say you have done in order to switch things around also because remember you didn't have enough time to now make a lot of mistakes you didn't have enough mm. resources as well to try out this and that what is it that you had to now um implement quickly in a way that you're sure that not really sure but it has to work single most important skill any entrepreneur can learn any entrepreneur can learn is sales any, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're a coder, you're an engineer, you're a mechanic, you're a, I don't know, a, a beer, brew, drafts. I don't care what you do. The single most critical skill you will learn as an entrepreneur, and it is, it is 10 times more important than every other skill that comes after it, is sales. So there's, if there's one excuse I never accept from entrepreneurs, is I can't sell. Yeah. Then don't yeah. be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's many other, go be an accountant somewhere, go practice HR. Yeah. You know, there are companies that have nice long meetings and people yes. sit and they have cookies and biscuits yeah. and there's an agenda. <laughs> Go there. Go there. That's where they belong. <laughs> That's where you belong. But in, in our world, we sell. So, so... We, I like that. So, that, I like so, that. so that's the yeah. first thing. And the second thing I want to say your, to your question is, I also hate entrepreneurs that have the idea that they've got to have runway before they start a business. Mm. And there's this pervasive culture now in South Africa. You know, mm. people go and create a business plan and the business plan, I say, I need 18 months runway and I'm going to raise, raise capital and there's 18 months runway. Who's runway? <laughs> Where are you running? On, on whose money, right? Because somebody has to pay the piper. So you want to start this thing and you're telling funders, we've got a part with money to fund your dreams? I got my own dreams, player. I'll fund my own dreams. Yes, 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 yes. So the, the single most important skill you'll learn is sales. So what did I do? I sold. I used to do this thing called burn the line. I still in my business today, the team will tell you, I still tell them. Mm. Burn the line. Yes. You know what that means? It means you pick up the phone, you come up with a telephone directory, and you do not put that thing down until you close the sale. Wow. I don't care what you say. What are you selling? HR consulting services? What do you, how do you think you're gonna do it? Invite people for coffees at uh, Melrose Arch? Doesn't work. That won't work. Yeah. Run an email shot on MailChimp? That won't work. Mm. A clever little campaign on Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> that will not work. Get on the phone, get a directory, pick up the phone, and dial the fucking number. Yeah. That's it. It's not, it, it, I mean, uh, it's, it, it really is not that complex. Even today, people don't, guys, guys don't, even today, I sell. When the team has the sale, they've got to close and they need the big hitter, they pull Vosian. And I, what I, I will walk in and I will close. That's what I do. Because if you, if you can't bridge that skill as an entrepreneur, everything else you learn is immaterial. Yeah. The ability to develop now, you know, now you guys, I, think, I, just, I feel like people are just distracted. Mm. People are busy designing websites and logos. <laughs> let's on. <laughs> what do you mean, let's on? <laughs> trying to look pretty online. No, you know? <laughs> not doing profiles. And, what are you doing, guys? People are trying to short circuit, just get, just. So. If you're an entrepreneur today and you've been in business for less than three years, a task for you when you leave here. When you leave here, designate one day in the week. Designate a morning in that day. You start at nine, you finish at 11. You come up with a cold call list of two, 200. You know how I know? Because in two hours, you'll make 200 phone calls. And here's how the rules work in sales. It's 10 for one. You make 10 phone calls, you get four appointments, one sale. But if you don't make the 10 phone calls, the one sale doesn't come. When you've done that, and you've got clients, and you're billing, and you're doing work, then you can worry about, what's my website look like? What does my brand look like? Absolutely, Putting up an Instagram yeah. picture of you and your nice car. And, yes. but then you can do that stuff. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, I, I also, I think I must talk about your public... You use... Do they still call you the rock star of public speaking? Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> what came first? Was it public speaking or was it the entrepreneurial... Both. Both. They all came in the, the what made time. me really what what made me what makes me really good as a speaker is I've never thought of it as a I've never thought of speaking as a thing it's a business and and I was quite lucky so so when my in the early days when in the early days I used to use public speaking money to finance the business because there were times when we'd do work in the business and the clients would pay us late. But I was getting paid five, six thousand rand a speaking engagement, mm. right? So I had money coming in. But what made me, what made me then and still does now is, for me, it's a business. It's not. So I don't. Th there are people who do it as an ego thing. So they go, well, you know, I know. and they're yes. listed on their profile. Yes. I'm a what to add speaker? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I can, so I run it as a business. So, yes. so here's what that means. I was the very first speaker in South Africa to what we do call a sole designate. Which means I went to all agencies in the country and I said to them, I don't want to work with you. So the African market is fairly oligopolistic. So the, the access to conferencing and client events is controlled by agencies. So going to an agency and telling them you don't want to work with them is suicide. Mm. Yeah. I went to order them and I said, I don't want to work with you. I don't want you to touch my stuff. You don't represent me. Take all my stuff down on your website. Mm. The reason I did it was because I understood a very simple fundamental law of marketing, which is he who sells the product controls product placement, positioning and sentiment. And if they were selling me, they were positioning me next to speakers they had no business positioning me next to. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I, was going, I, was going, I was going, guys, do you understand that I've got now four? But at the time I was like, do you understand that I've got like two degrees, I'm building a business, mm -hmm. I'm working these kind of hours, yes. and you're comparing me with this guy? Yes. No. Mm -hmm. So take my stuff off. Yeah. And when I did it, my price tripled. But so, but then, we'll see. How were you then? <laughs> no, wait. How were you then marketing getting the yourself? Sale. This is yes. the point. So, this is the point I'm coming to. So, the first thing I did is I got rid of them, these sort of third party distributors. The second thing I did is I thought, and this is a, it's a great lesson for entrepreneurs to try. Just try this for yourself. If you ever lack motivation, if you ever lack motivation, just imagine your worst nightmare is coming true. Imagine the worst nightmare coming true. Imagine you've got zero money in the bank account, your biggest customer, your biggest customer leaves you, and your biggest competitor doubles on, on, on revenue. What would you do? Okay, there's nothing like a good crisis to galvanize effort. So, but what I do sometimes is I force myself into the crisis. So I go, things are comfortable. Hmm. Excuse my language. Let's fuck shit up. <laughs> So that's, so, so yeah. hold on, so, so, what I did, so I did that, and then, so then what I did is I knew, now that I've fired them, yes. I now have to build my own distribution model. Right. right, so we're going back, guys, this is 06. I went and registered Vusi as a trademark. Yeah. Wow. Then Vusi Tembegoya. Then got Vusi.co.za, then Vusi .com. This is before people even knew about websites. There was no Facebook, no Twitter back then. Mm. I went and did it. Then I went and found out where were the conferencing people going to conferences. They were all going to Mice and Saki and all the, and that's where I was. Mm -hmm. And that's where I positioned my brand. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting thing. If you believe in the quality of your product, you don't need nobody to sell it for you. Yeah. So I knew all I needed was one engagement. One would give me four. Because in the room, there were 200 people. Yes. Four of them need somebody for their next event. Yes. Those four give me 16. Yes. And then it's a multiple effect. So, but, so I've always thought of it as a business. Mm. Always. I mean, I look at any artist that succeeds, thinks of it. I look at Black Coffee, great example. Mm. I know him well. You talk to that guy, the guy's not a DJ. Mm. That guy's a machine. Yes. Yeah. He understands marketing, product, pricing, operations better than most CEOs of listed companies. Mm. He's a machine, right? He is a businessman. His business is just music, mm. but he's a businessman. How do then people get into that mode of using their talents to now, um, you know, make it in, turn it into business without, without having to, because I know a lot of, especially a lot of musicians and artists, they sort of like have an ego thing or like they think that their talent oh. on its own is going to get them forward. Oh, that's so you easy. Know? So there's a, there's, a, there's a guy who used to run a company called Dream Team. I think he's now a record level executive. He, he lectures at, le at Gibbs. His name is Rifilwe. He said something to me once. I'll never forget. He's, he used to manage Kuli Chana and he was having this conversation with Kuli and he said to him, um, talent is never enough. Yeah. 
it's just like, I feel like you could write a book and just title it, Talent is Never Enough. Because th there are stories, books, poems that can be written about people who made the presumption that talent was enough. So the reason artists typically do that is because they just want to be the talent. Because they think in their minds, I can sing. I know you can sing, but can you send an invoice? <laughs> no, really. Can you, do a, can you do a tax recon at the, end of, at the end of two weeks when you're sending out your VAT payments to SARS? Can you do that? Mm. Well, because if you can't do that, you're going to have to hire an accountant who can do it, and you're going to end up with a Tony Braxton. Mm. <laughs> so, and, and by the way, in today's environment, you have zero excuse not to know how to do something. Absolutely. I could understand Brenda Fasi not knowing how to do it. But in today's world of ubiquity of information, the zero marginal cost, the internet of things, you have no excuse not to know how to do something for yourself. Zero. Hmm. Wow. I want to now fast forward to my growth fund. Yes. <laughs> okay. What is it? What is my growth fund? You launched it, was it last year? No, no, no. Before that. We were, yes. we were working with MGF as beta four years ago. So long before I sold, so I many people. So I had an I had a so I had a business and I built it. So this is what I did. So I built a strong global public speaking business. But what does public speaking buy me? It buys me access. It buys me influence. As we speak on this, mm -hmm. there's probably two CEOs of listed companies I can't call on this number. Every other one I can. And when I do, and here's how you know when you know someone, it's not who you can call. It's when you answer, what do they call you? Is it a hello or is it Vusi it? Yes. yes. That's network. Network is so public speaking accelerated my network. That's all it because who was booking me? CEOs of companies that had big complex makers. problems. Yeah. What I did, because remember, I'm a businessman. Mm -hmm. I just happened to speak. So most speakers <laughs> idiots. <laughs> Most of these, somebody sold them this American template. Americans yeah. did this thing. Americans went and said, all you need is one hit talk and you can travel America and do the same talk. That's why to this day, he's a doyen of this industry. He is phenomenal. But to this day, you listen to Les Brown, he still talks about, I was hungry. <laughs> Les was saying that 30 years ago. Do you know why? Well, America has 52 states. It's 300 million people. It's the largest middle yeah. class in the world. In America, you only need one hit. Yes. And you can tour 52 states. One state a year is 52 years. <laughs> you get it? It's not, so it's not, it's not. In America, you only need one hit. Yes. Here, it doesn't work that way. So when I looked at it, I went and thought, why would I develop one product and then just statically deliver this thing? Same joke, same pause, same content. Doesn't make sense. No. Yeah. So what I then started doing is I'd go, every single client that was booking me, I'd go and meet with them. Mm. I didn't understand it, but in my mind, I was building the network because the speaker would, the, the, the CEOs went, wait, he wants to meet with us. Mm. Yeah. The speaker speaking at our conference wants to meet. Why does he want to meet with us? He says he wants us to brief him. Mm. Brief him? <laughs> About what? <laughs> so then I go and meet. Now I meet Stephen Kossoff who runs Investec. And I said, so tell me about your business. Mm. Tell me about what's happened. Tell me about where you started from. Tell me about the challenges you're facing. Tell me about the strategy of the firm. Tell me where you see it in five years' time. Mm. Who else gets this kind of access? I walk out, I've got a direct relationship. And then what I did, and this was, it's still to this day, it's my competitive edge. Every single engagement, every single client is tailored. Wow. But you've got to remember, I trained, what is it? Four years as a classically trained public speaker. I won the world championship twice. My skill mm -hmm. is I can develop a presentation yesterday, deliver it today like I've done it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. So, so because of it, I, could, I can develop different presentations tailored and deliver them at a 99% efficacy each time. Mm -hmm. Most people can only do one because they have to rehearse it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So that was what accelerated my business. So I built this public speaking business. On the back of building it, I go and speak at conferences and clients go, you know, what you said was really interesting. Could you help us with that? Well, Chief Pate. <laughs> I mean, yes. uh, why, would, why would you leave money on the table? Yeah. So when I built Motivate, yeah. I built it with a zero marketing cost. Zero. I had mm. no marketing budget. Mm. For the first six years, we had no website. Wow. We didn't yeah. need a website. I traveled to Washington. I became a, a fellow at the Balanced Scorecard Institute. Why? 
Because in 2009, 2010, I was implementing balanced scorecard implementations long before people knew what balanced scorecard is. Mm. I've since forgotten what balanced scorecard is because my life has kind of moved on and now everybody does balanced scorecard. Mm. So the point is, when I then, so, and how did I know there was a client? In fact, I'll tell you, it was the AA. They were implementing a balanced scorecard process mm -hmm. and they asked me to come and speak at the conference and at the, in the middle of it, they said, can you help us with this? I said, oh, I don't know what it is, mm. but I'll find out. And I went and learned and then I came back. I was a fellow at the Balanced Scorecard Institute, developed a product and started selling it. Mm -hmm. I made maybe 30 bar mm. right. over the years selling just that product. Mm. But, but the point is, put yourself in that space, yes. be aggressive, learn, be hungry, yes. be humble, be willing to learn new things all the time, and don't sit with version one of the product. Mm. Iterate this thing as often as you can. Get better every single time. Mm -hmm. you have, if you have an employee, and this is the test if you're an entrepreneur, if you have an employee today, you fire them, if they come back in three months' time, they shouldn't recognize what you're doing. You should go, yeah. whoa, you've moved so fast. Go, yeah. 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 Right? And then the path of my, oh, did I say my name? <laughs> 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 the, the path of yeah. my growth fund yeah. was, why does it exist? Who is it for? So, so, so anyway, so I build my, uh, Motivate. I get an offer from an American group and they go, we want to buy your business. I'm like, uh, I'm not selling. Mm -hmm. They come back, we want to buy your business. Uh, I'm not selling. They came back a third time. Uh, fourth time when they came back, Jacob Zuma fired that guy called Ntlan Tlan Tlan and then, and then the rand went this way mm. and the dollar that way. Yeah. And I looked at what they were offering and I was like, mm. to, this is a pretty good time to sell. <laughs> yeah. So I sold. Yeah. Um, so, why do, so you asked the question, why does my growth fund exist? Mm. So I think m human beings go through different stages. First, we go through the stage of wondering whether or not we're capable. Then we go through a stage of proving we're capable. Then we wonder, could we help others realize they're capable? Yeah. Right, so I'm just at the third stage. So wow. I wondered and I proved it. And now I'm going, and I'm going, well, now that I've done it, could I help other people reach their own potential? Yeah. Right? Wow. Um, and it's, it's been a fascinating journey, guys. The past four years for us has been phenomenal. Most people didn't know about my growth fund until maybe a year ago. Mm. Why? Because in three years, we were testing, iterating, trying, mm. working, failing. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. still running Motivate at the time. I had, a, I had an earn out, so I had mm -hmm. to earn out the portion that they were paying me. Mm -hmm. but, but now that we exist and we're fully in the market, we are purely focused on working with entrepreneurs to help them realize and recognize what they are capable of. That's why it's called My Growth Fund. Wow, that is amazing. Um, before, I want to talk about your book, of course. And before I get into that, I just want to ask if you guys have any question for Vusi. Okay. Just say your name and just try to speak louder and keep your question as brief as you can. Um, sure. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, because I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't want to rob people of suffering. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, it's important. It's a, why, why, you know, I, I get, so I get, maybe, I, 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 by the way, I'm not being facetious, but let me come at it differently. How, how do you know until you know, yeah. right? And I, my view, so I mean, the, the criteria we have, for those of you who are wondering at my growth fund, when we started our criteria was you got to make a million rand in turnover, it's now 4.1 million. So you got to make 4.1 million before we even take a meeting with you. You're going to sign on to an 18 month program, the first 10 months you pay us for the work we're going to do. Why? Because I want skin in the game. It costs me six times what our entrepreneurs pay us to run the business. So you're not paying it because I need the money. You're paying it because I want you committed to the process of what we're doing. We started a program called My Top 40. Of the My Top 40, 23 are left. 17 are gone. Because it's my growth. <laughs> right? So, so I, w I, I don't think I'd migrate into that space because I think the worst thing we can do for entrepreneurs today is to soften and morally coddle them when they want to start. No, like, 
You want to go register a company? I go give you the text, you give you the train, you hambu your sips, you me on that queue for four hours. You figure back tell you the system is offline and you can't register. Go, go do that. You know, like suffer a little. Now people are being molly coddled, and no, 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 no. And as a, as a country, what we're doing is we're molly coddling starter entrepreneurs, but we're not focusing on where the impact is, which is growth entrepreneurs. The real impact is not taking a guy who runs one company and doubling it to two, which is what I heard the, the president say today. He says, if we get every single entrepreneur to hire one person, we have two people. Are you fucking kidding? <laughs> what you should be doing is finding people that employ 10 people and doubling it. Because then you get 20 people employed. See, it's the same philosophy. It's just what we're doubling. But what we're, we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're focusing on these one-man bands. That's not going to move the needle. We've got to focus on the high-impact, high-growth stuff. That moves the needle. Great. Second question. Mm, yeah. Hi, please, please nobody tweet what I said about the president. <laughs> <laughs> please don't. I, I don't need that kind of... PR. Um, what is your question? So, hi, my name is Makato. Hi, Makato. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Lady in red. <laughs> okay. It's not about me. It's about Busi. No, but you look beautiful. You look really beautiful. Thank you so <laughs> much. You see, it's not about me. So, uh, my question. Um, you know, I. I hope it comes out right because you are intimidating me. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, do you think that it's possible for an entrepreneur to start businesses? I, I heard you say, as a public speaker, you think business. But be, when you're not a public speaker, but you're starting businesses, do you think that it's possible to start businesses and not be the business? You know when clients normally want Vusi, Tembegwayo, yes. and the business, it's not about you yes it's about the service that you're yes. offering so is it possible for one to start businesses wow. and not be the business not only is it not possible but it's necessary okay. let me tell you if there is the biggest challenge i have ever faced on on my and i i'm i'm i'll say to the team today that i think we should write a book on scaling because yes. i think the single biggest challenge entrepreneurs face is scaling yes. but the, the biggest impediment to scale is the personality you know so so and, and, and the, part, the, the hard part is, how do you remove your soul mm. and embed it into this inanimate thing called a business, a PTY LTD with a VAT number, mm. and know that it will deliver it regardless of whether or not you're there? So how, how is it, how is it that Apple still creates the most intuitive products today, but the founder died years ago? Mm. How did he leave him? I don't know if you guys get it, but at a philosophical level, like how did he remove his soul and put it in it. Like the guys who, who started McDonald's. Mm. How is it that anywhere in the world you go, when you go to a McDonald's, it's exactly the same. Yeah. How did they remove themselves and embed themselves in the business? Mm. And it has a little bit to do with process and operations and efficiency and manualing and standardization. Yes. You know, Lean Six Sigma, all of that stuff. It has a bit to do with it, but that's not it. Mm. Because even if you get that stuff right, if you don't get the passion, the commitment, the human drive, the there's a, there's a certain, there's a certain uh, you gotta bring to the work <laughs> yeah. that you either have or you don't as an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. This guy is killing me with the flashes. <laughs> so, Thank turn you. It down. so the point is, is it, is it not only, it's, is it possible? Not only is it possible, it's necessary. That said, it is the hardest thing to do. Mm. And this is my final comment on this, and I'll tell you why. Because when you start and you're an entrepreneur, what are you? Why, why did we create, why does the word entrepreneur exist? Because how else do you define someone who between eight and nine does sales, mm. then between nine and 10 does marketing, then between yeah. 10 and 11 does HR, then between 11 and 12 does client relations and stakeholder engagement. <laughs> how else do you define that? Yes. Like if, if I said to you as an entrepreneur today, just write your job spec. Everything. Yeah, exactly. Like. The word you would write is everything. everything. So when you are everything, as you build and grow and scale, it's hard to figure out which part of the everything you need to embed in the business and which part you need to keep. Can I just... Okay, do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Does it not depend on your hiring that oh. also allows you to scale? Yeah. We have an expression at our firm, watch the door. Okay. What does that mean? Be careful who you let in. 
especially in this country, because once they're in, they're in. You know what makes the American economy great is in America there's those two words that make the economy tick. You're fired. In this country, somebody doesn't deliver you to fire them, you must take them through performance review, then performance management, then you must... Uh, okay, cool, let's move on. We don't have... It. Oh my God. I'm, I'm only going to take a few questions. This lady okay. here just raised her hands. Shh. The side of the room will kill you. Um, so I'm hi, suggest you take some. Um, my have name is Vivana. Hi. Hi. Um, Your name is? Vivana. Hi. Um, okay. okay, so in large organizations, we often have this problem with bureaucracy, red tape, you know, processes that take a long time. And um, recently, companies have been coming out with something called Skunk Works. Yeah. So producing sort of like a startup within a larger organization. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for yeah. example, that's where the M in BMW came from. What are you, what's your view on Skunk Works? So um, when does it work? When doesn't it work? So coincidentally, I studied, I, part of what I, Part of what I studied when I was doing my MBA was the Skunk Works concept. So people don't, the, the genesis of Skunk Works actually comes from World War II. So, and, and here was the, so it was interesting. So Hitler, Hitler had a philosophy. It was an idea. And what Hitler wondered was, was it possible to completely repair a human body in a 24 hour cycle? So you go to war and get shot, come back and would treat you and heal the wound in 24 hours. And to do it, they developed a regime of medicinal treatment that today we know as steroids. So the reason bodybuilders use steroids is because when you go to the gym and you train, you tear the muscle. The steroid repairs the muscle quicker. That's why bodybuilders get big quickly. Yeah? yeah. That regime comes from Hitler's time. So the skunk works was what Hitler did is he took um, doctors and professors and he put them in a room and he said, the problem for you to solve is that. That's where it actually comes from. So you talk about M and BMW, same two for AMG for Mercedes, same two for the RS for the, yeah. for the Audi brand. These are all parts of the business that take what the business does and think about how do we make it agile, more fitting, and more responsive to the customer's requirements. Does it work? With very limited success in corporate. And I'll tell you why. Uh, a dear friend of mine is a fellow called Jürgen Knastorp. He's the CEO of Lego. He tried it. When he took over Lego, it was, it, Lego was, by the way, still family owned. It's the largest family owned, it's the second largest family owned business in the world. But when he took over Lego, <clears throat> they, were, they were bankrupt. And Lego's in Bullent in Denmark. Beautiful. If you go to Bullent, Denmark, and I've been, the entire city of Bullent is just Lego. Everybody who lives there lives, breeds, works at Lego. So when he took over Lego, what he did was he took the skunk works and he embedded it in Silicon Valley. And it didn't work because those people were not embedded in the culture of the business. So what we're learning today in management sciences is what actually works when you want to do successful skunk work concepts is not to take people from the business and put them in a separate part and make them some special class. It's actually to take out, bring external people and embed them into strategic parts of the business so that you innovate the whole, not create a subunit of innovation. Because every time the subunit of innovation comes up with a product or an idea or a concept, the whole rejects it. Yeah. Just think about it. If I'm working at a place for 20 years and they go and hire these young people now who are going to come up with stuff, if I run the PL, every time those young people come up with something, I'm going to find excuses why it doesn't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Last question. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Vusi. I'm Zandile. I just want to ask um, throughout your journey, uh, is, do you have like your one biggest regret? And if you do, what is the lesson like, that you can share with us, okay, if any? I don't have regrets, only lessons. Lessons, okay. Yeah, so I, I, the word regret to me seems, in, it just, it's, he, it's, a very, it's a very heavy word. Okay. Regret, there's almost the assumption that I'm without power, or without agency. And I do, I, if there is one thing I reject, it's the idea that I don't have power or agency. That's rubbish, even poor people have power. Um, your, your, your choices might be limited, but you still have them. Okay. So I don't have, I don't have uh, regrets. I suppose I'm sad about the fact that I went for many years without talking to my mother. Okay. My mom and I, my mom is to this day still my hero. Still. Uh, I, uh, I, I, there are not, in the length and breadth of the English language, there are not words to describe how I feel about that woman. There, there just aren't. But for many years, my mom and I had a strained relationship. And, and 
and I'm, it's still something about which I'm sad. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy today that we're really, really cool. In fact, I was talking to you on the way here. That we're really, really cool. And we have an amazing relationship. And it's interesting because we, my mom was, my, my brother and sister are both here. And my, my brother and sister will also tell you that they resented me growing up because they feel like I was the special kid who got everything from my mom. Mm. And in their defense, it's probably true. But that's also because I'm good looking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, so my mom was always there, always supporting. I mean, just think about it. A single woman raising three kids, in fact, five kids, um, on less than what it cost me today to put a full tank of petrol in my car. You've got three kids going to Model C school. They do extramural activities. There's, how do you make that balance? To the, I still don't know today how my mother dropped a budget. Um, I'm going, to I'm going to tell you guys a personal story. Okay. Uh, please don't share this. I never battled with taking off a lady's bra. <laughs> no, because, because when we were younger, my mother couldn't afford to buy underwear. So she wore bras that didn't fit and they would chafe into her. And every night when she came home, oh, yeah. she would ask us to take off her bra. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now it sounds like him, to, for, yeah. for a woman to make that kind of sacrifice yeah. Yeah. You, you gotta so that's what my mother sacrificed for us yeah. then we went through this very difficult period and now we're, so I, I'm, I'm sad about that yeah. but sad about today that I don't get to perhaps spend as much time with my kids as I'd like to so yeah. I'm also very obsessive um, which is remember my thing you learned it in 10 years I'll do it in one yeah. mm -hmm. it's not just a philosophy I live it so yeah. For instance, even though we're in the same city, my family lives in one place, I live in another. I live in an apartment which is a block away from the office. Why? Because between Monday and Friday, there are no distractions. I'm fully about work. No. I could drive to my kids in 20 minutes. But Monday to Friday, they know, dad is at work. And there's, there's no debate, there's no, it's very clear in their minds, it's fixed. I'm, so I'm quite nomadic like that. But, but you also have to schedule your life so that it works like it. I hear entrepreneurs today starting businesses and you're in, you're in the very first 10 years and you're talking about a work-life balance. In 10 years, work-life balance. Yeah, there's no such. Would you, I mean, you, you've, you've got a, the only guy who succeeds is the guy who's willing to do what the other guy's not. Right? You're going to leave at 8, I'm leaving at 8.30. You leave at 8.30, I'm leaving at 9. Mm. You take an hour lunch, I'm taking a 30-minute lunch. Mm. You get it? Mm. So, so you've got to bring that level of intensity, commitment to everything you do. Success, guys, I'm convinced about this. If somebody wrote a formula on success, nowhere in it would be good looks and personality. Mm. Nowhere in it would be luck or where you were born into. Mm. Success is just... Time, application, commitment, effort, and ruthless dedication to what you do. And I know you stress a lot about being the best. Yeah. I don't know how to be number two. Yeah. Like, because I mean, I, I was reading one, one interview um, on, online and you said, I think this lady was asking you, what can you say about female entrepreneurs and female black entrepreneurs? And then you said, yes, you're black, you're female, and then what? Yes. <laughs> you know. yeah. Do people want your product? Are you good? Well, you not, just, not just, if I may, if I may, and I know we've got another question, but not just to black females, but, and I'm going to say something which, if somebody here tweets it, I'm sure black Twitter will have a field day about it, but what the hell. <laughs> it's not just a message, I think, to black female. It's just a message to black people. Mm. So, I'm a, I've not yet, I've not yet, I've not even reached my pinnacle, mm. but I've, I've done well enough to know that nowhere have I done well because I'm black. Yes. And everywhere I have been where people try to denigrate my success to blackness, I've rejected it. Mm. Yeah? So I told you about the speakers agencies. Mm -hmm. The reason I left speakers agencies was because corporates would go, we need a black speaker. Mm. And they go, we have Vosi and Mandla and Simpi. And I was going, I'm not a black speaker. Mm. You get it? So... So even today, you start a, and it's easy to know, if you're starting a business and you need a, a tax clearance and a BE certificate, you're selling your skin color, not your product. Mm. It's not rocket science. So, yeah. so just, if you, if you are ruthlessly committed and dedicated to what you do, that stuff just doesn't matter. Mm. Okay, we have to wrap up now, but 
before we before oh, we you, let you, you leave, you, I know oh Elise is putting She's under pressure. She's gonna come on me. I know. Let's, 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 do you guys want to take another ten minutes? How do you okay, think? cool. Strictly ten minutes. Sorry. Yeah, just answer your question, girl. Ask ask your question. Yeah. Just speak louder. Yes. wanting to work a lot with um, you, obviously work with you in a form of me checking out what you do. So this is Ntabi. Ntabi is a, a founder of IL Design, which is a design company. And at the same time, she's a founder of Real Talk with Ntabi Foundation, which deals with public speaking and motivational speaking. But what I want to turn around is how to link the two. Um, and I even got to a point where my business card has my business side of things and my motivation. But now, I feel like I need a strategy to make all of this work for my business because I'm also, I don't want to consider myself just, just a startup, but I believe that there's so much growth in my company. But now, how do I find the better strategy to, to put them together? I'm not sure if you get what yeah, I mean. I understand. Uh, it's a very simple question to answer. Strategy, when you're an entrepreneur, strategy is a fallacy. It doesn't exist. There's, there's no such thing as strategy. Yeah. Not in the first three years of your business. Strategy what? There's no, there's no, do you know, do you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story very quickly. When I was, when I was doing my MBA, I was taught strategy by this phenomenal fellow. He was a, uh, an Arabic fellow from, uh, I think Syria. And he said something that I, I will never forget. He said, strategy is not a thing. It's a series of things. So even the idea that strategy is a singular is wrong. Uh, any time th something has worked strategically, the reason it is strategic is because there have been a thousand things involved in it. So when you're an entrepreneur, there are no thousand things. So at best, you can be tactical. Right. So the question you're asking is, what tactics should I deploy to link the two? And then I'm going to tell you an answer I tell everybody in my company. There's a guy called Carl Vestvik. A company, he runs a company called Retail Capital. We produce a series on my growth fund, our YouTube channel. And uh, I've just, there's a, we just published uh, an interview that I did with Michael, and Carl is next. Carl said something to me which was interesting. He said, in business in the first three years, your best odds of success is about using the case method. So I said, what's case? He said, copy and steal everything. <laughs> so you, you want to you wanna figure out how should I be linking them? There is, and if you're an entrepreneur in the room, listen to this. There is no problem in the world, an American has not solved. <laughs> None. I promise you now. Yeah. So if I was you, rather than spend time trying to create, I'll just go, who else has yeah. done this? Yeah. And then you case. <laughs> One last question for the gentleman that side to speak that's louder. Side. Oh, I have see. Sorry, that side. Oh, I think that side had enough go. people. Good evening. Um, I just have a question around the actual ecosystem on the, the entrepreneurship ecosystem in South Africa. What your feeling is towards um, incubators and accelerators and a proliferation of it and whether it actually really um, adds the value that it should and how do we actually fix it? You look familiar. You and Dragon's Den. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I remember you. Uh, uh, no, I was at the gym. You did the business with a, with a pod to connect, right? It was luminous. Yeah. Um, so the question was around uh, the proliferation of incubators. Yeah? Look, they, it can't be bad, I suppose. Uh, we're busy building an incubator now. We've got one going down in Toyando. We've been working on it for a really, really long time. Uh, it's taken us a really long time. Uh, we have a specific, we have a specific go-to market with a very specific philosophy of what we want to do, right? And I'm quite fixed on the philosophy of what we want to do and the problem we're solving. Um, so it can't be bad that they're there. It really can't. What I would say though is I think entrepreneurs will thrive whether or not they're there. So that's the first thing I want to say. Then the second thing, and it's just sort of a closing comment to your question is we in, in South Africa have not thought long and hard about how do you actually build an entrepreneurship ecosystem. Yes. So what we do is the quick wins. Mm. 
The law says you want to get points on your BE, spend money on ESD. So corporates spend a little bit of money on ESD. Frankly, they cheat the system. So they come up with some program which doesn't work. They have a big launch event mm -hmm. and then nothing happens for 12 months and then they'll do it again the following year. Um, the government wants to do stuff so they do stuff and it doesn't work. So if you want to build an ecosystem, there's only three parts of the ecosystem that you need to build. You need, you need the innovation, you need the talent, you need the capital. It's, it's really not that complex. So do we have the innovation complex? My view is we do. Do we have the talent? My view is we do. Do we have the, the capital? Well, that's the problem. In, in the US, and I, I don't want to drag this question on too long, but I just want to answer, the, if you'll allow me, I want to give him a full answer. Mm -hmm. In the US, consider for a moment that Facebook ran for seven years pre-revenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not pre-profit, pre-revenue. Which means they ran for seven years not selling anything to anyone. Mm -hmm. For seven years, they were in beta testing the product, mm -hmm. they were recruiting, and they were building the set of matrices they required to build a business, right? Amazon is now the world's largest retailer by market capitalization. It's been around for 15 years. For the first 13 years of Amazon's existence, it made losses. Now, as a person who runs a business, I know when you have a loss at the end of the year, it's funded from two places, shareholders' funds or debt. So who was funding Amazon's losses? Right? Somebody funded it for 13 years, even though it wasn't making money. Sure. So the power of what America does, you're seeing it now with the, Chi with the Chinese doing it. You saw it with, uh, in Kuala Lumpur they do it, the Malaysians do it. Now the Colombians are doing it. And we just are not getting the message. What you don't, what you don't need, you don't need a state funding agency. You don't need two state funding agencies. What you need is a hundred venture capitalists. Mm. Mm. Each of them with a hundred million. Mm. Mm. And each of them willing to exit deals to each other. Because then here's what will happen. Beth will start a business. I'll fund her for two years. At the end of the two years, she will have proven the concept in the business model. She still won't be profitable. She'll do another capital call and I won't want to participate, but I will know that he does. So I'll call him and I say, I've got a deal. I've funded it for two years. It's now at less risk because it's been running for two years. Fund it. Mm -hmm. And so he will. Mm -hmm. And then number three, number four, number five, by the time they get to the seventh or eighth iteration of the funding round, it's now running and it's a profitable business. But here, what happens is you've got to start day one, be profitable day one, cash flow generating day, do you get it? So, so if you want to build an entrepreneurship ecosystem, it's really not rocket science, the stuff you've got to be doing. But, and then I'm done with that question. <laughs> Why is it not happening? Very simple reason. Because wolves led by sheep are still sheep. So the problem we have in South Africa is that the people driving the entrepreneurship conversation have never been entrepreneurs. Yes. Like you, you've never registered a business. You've never, you, you've never had to go and sit at a government department and say, I'm not leaving until you pay me. Mm. If, you've ne if you've never been owed by the Department of Health for six months and had to explain to your staff why you're not paying them, yeah. how are you just, you go to Corpus today, watch some of the people who run ESD programs. I say this with the greatest of respect, they have good hearts. Yes. But you know why those ESD programs don't work? Because it was somebody who was working in another function, has got an MBA, they needed a place to give them, so they put them in ESD. Yeah. Yeah. Entrepreneurs, we as entrepreneurs, are the only ones who are going to create solutions for us. Yes. Yeah. That's why I created my growth fund, because I was realizing there's a problem here, mm -hmm. and everybody else solving the problem is everybody but the people for whom the problem is being solved. Yeah. 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 Oh man. There's a beautiful line by Drake, he says, he's, he's, it, it's a, how? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Drake's a philosopher. Drake's a poet. I live on hip-hop music, by the way. But there's, there's a beautiful line, line by Drake. He's talking to his mother and he says, don't ever take advice. That was the best advice. So the best advice I give to entrepreneurs is, even though I'm going to give you this advice, when I'm done, don't take it. And, and I'll tell you why. Because if I listened, I wouldn't be here. Like if I listened and they told me, don't do this, don't try that, I wouldn't be here. The, the, this thing is called entrepreneurship because I must, walk, I must trailblaze. I must walk this path alone. So to, so to answer your question, so I'm, so I'm saying, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, but y you know, you've asked what's my, my advice. My first piece of my advice is don't take it. Then the, sec the, then the second thing I'm going to say is, so what's my view on diversification versus focus? I, I mean, I, for me, there's, there's almost, intuitively I want to say to you that there's almost no question. No question. Like you, you, 
for the first 40 years of its existence, Coca-Cola just had one Coca-Cola with one bottle. Yeah? So today it's very in vogue. You find entrepreneurs that create Mazlamini holdings. And then you say, so what do you do? Well, I, I'm in construction, and then I'm in energy, and I'm in catering. And yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, what's that? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. So my view, and if you're one of those entrepreneurs in the room, it's okay. But if, if my view, focus, focus. One thing. Do one thing, try it, fail, and then do It's a bit like dating. Just one. <laughs> okay, we, we have to let you go. But I think you must just briefly tell us about your book. And unfortunately, we don't have it here. But whoever who wants it, who is it for? Why did you write that book? Who is it for? And how they can get it? <laughs> uh, so th typically, the first question I got asked about the book is, so tell us about the title. The Magna Carta. The Carta of Exponentiality, um, yeah. Yeah, so, who's, so, who's the, so who's the book for? Um, hmm. if, if, you are, if you are an entrepreneur and you're looking, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for the, f so if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for this, that's who it's for. If you're a manager and you're looking for that, that's what it's for. My, my, my gift, my talent is that I shift. That's all I do. Mm. That's all I do, guys. I walk into spaces and they shift. Mm. If I walk into a company and it's battling, it'll shift. Wow. If I walk into a room and people don't have direction, it'll shift. Yeah. That's all I do. Mm. All I bring into, into a, a complex and a space. It's in my physiology. Mm. So the, the reason the book is, writ is written for people who are hungry for the shift. So I've been in corporate, I'm a manager for five years. We're doing kind of the same stuff. Mm. I wrote it so that you could, you could go to work on Monday and go, man, we're missing it. Yeah. Well, I'm an entrepreneur, I've been running for three years. I'm now caught, I'm in the quagmire. And typically what happens in three years is entrepreneurs grow year one, year two, and then year three, they start to plateau. Mm. And you're looking for that growth again? Mm -hmm. That's who the book is for. It's yeah. not, in it there are business concepts, there are case studies, there's stories, there's personal philosophies. and and the, when, it's in, when, you know, when we, when we, I gotta tell you guys, when we wrote the book, it was, the first iteration of it was just over 480 pages. Those of you in the room who have it know that it's just under what? It's just over 200? Thereabout. We went specifically through a process of culling it. Remember your question about the dedication? Myself and fellow who I worked on in the book in my, in my team had three days consecutively where we slept at the office to meet the deadline. Because I was launching in Barcelona, we had 5,000 copies pre-sold, yes. and I had to meet the Barcelona deadline. But what we did was we then culled the book. It was 400 plus pages, 480 pages. I don't read 480 pages, I don't know about you guys. Yeah. It's, it's a book, it's not a textbook. So we, we went deliberately through a process of culling it to make it thin enough so that you can pick it up, read it in a weekend, finish, and shift. It's, it's quality, not quantity, right? And one last question before I let you go. Oh, my God, I wish this conversation could just go on. <laughs> Don't you guys wish that? Uh, what is your cry for African entrepreneurs? Just to wrap up. Just wake up. You guys are sleeping. You know, there's, um, the young people say you're sleeping on yourself. You guys are sleeping. Entre African entrepreneurs, you guys are sleeping. You're, can I be honest? Yes. You're sleeping. You're entitled. You're lazy. You have, a sh you, have a, you have a quick return syndrome. You have too many expectations too quickly. Just wake up. Guys, wake up. It took, it, took 40, it took 30 years to build Apple. It took 40 years to build Dell. It took, I don't know, 40 years to build Microsoft. And this is in the world's largest economy. You're in the bottom of the darkest economy on earth. How long do you think it's going to take you? Mm. Wake up. Yeah. It's, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not just about the effort, but wake up on everything. Wake up to the opportunities that are alive. Wake up to the political systems that govern us. Just wake up. Be awake. Watch what's happening around you. Read, love, live, learn. Be mm. in spaces. Be involved. Just get in. 
get in. Plug your, take this plug of yours in life and plug it into the cord of the it's system nice. so yeah. that we can all be in it together. But just wake up. Too many of us are sleeping. We're yeah. doing the same things we've always done. You're doing the same things everybody else has done. Mm. And then you're waiting for the world to come and meet you halfway. And it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Sure. Just wake up. And the minute you wake up, you'll see that the world is an incredible place. Wow. Um, just quickly, let me, let me just say this. So, mm. my view is books have not yet been written nor has history been imagined of our capabilities. The greatest thing that ever happened to Africa when they denied us endeavor, enterprise, individuality for hundreds of years was that they gave us no template to copy. So why are we copying it? Every single person in this room, do you get, when you're an entrepreneur, you are version one. You're it. There's never been an us before. Before this, they were in trenches at our age fighting for stuff. We are version one. Let's wake up. Write the template. Do the crazy wild things. Let's make mistakes. Let's, yes. let's, you know, let's just, let's wake up, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming through.